Well, thank you, Sam in Navin. Thank you, Rebecca in Dublin. It's so good to see you all today as we close off uh, this series. And like the guy said, we're asking the question uh, in this final message, how can I have a quality time, uh, a relationship every single day with the Father? Of course, it is every day because we're talking about the power of daily devotion, being in God's presence, hearing God's voice every single day. Now, we've talked about utensils, and we've talked about ingredients. The next thing you need if you're going to make a super successful secret sauce is you need a recipe, okay? How to, how to bring all these things together. And like I alluded to last week in part three, what we recommend, what we suggest as a type of recipe as a methodology, as a way of doing a devotion life is what's called soap. Now again, joking aside, it's not actual physical soap, although soap is good and we all need soap every day. But as has been the vibe for this whole series, soap is another acronym. And I'll explain what it means in a second. But I also want to give you a heads up because sometimes we can get confused. We can think, oh, the methodology, the powers and the methodology, you know, there's something, it's almost like magical. It's almost like it's spooky. It's almost like if you do these certain things a certain way, you'll achieve a certain result. But I want to say it very clearly the power is not in the methodology. The power is not in the practice. The power is not in the liturgy. The power is not in the buildings. The power is not in how we do things, our traditions, how we worship. The power is in the Christ of our worship. The power is in the Christ of our methodology. The power is not in us and what we do, but the power is in the one we do it with and the one for whom we do it for. And again, I'm not saying that soap is the only methodology or even the best in the world. I'm just saying after pastoring this church for 15 years, soap is the most effective one that we have found that works. And so many of you already know this because either you've soaped before or you are actively soaping and you can attest to and you can affirm the power of having something like a methodology like soap in your life. And again, if you're not a Christ follower, that's someone of faith today, that's okay. Because I want to encourage you, even if you don't believe in God, you need some kind of practice that will help you just process life. Why not considering at the very beginning of this message, why not considering adopting this methodology for seven days, 14 days, 21 days, I don't know. Why not just give it a go and see if it works in your life. So what is soap? We'll break it down. S stands for scripture. Because we understand, like we said, that scripture is how God speaks to us. O stands for observation, A stands for application, and prayer, P stands for prayer because we want to start our devotion with God speaking to us and end our devotion with us speaking to Him. So I want to break down each one of these four components today and explain what they are, how they work, and set you up, hopefully, to be able to do this every single day practically. Like I said before, why I love this is because whether you have five minutes or five hours, whether it's a paragraph, a note on a phone, or three or four pages in a journal, you know, the, the, the quantity of time is not really what makes soaping powerful. Like we said time and time again, it's the quality of time. And even if you say, listen, I have five minutes at a traffic light on the way to work in the morning, or I've got 10 minutes as I wait for the, the bus, the bus, whatever it is, it's not about the quantity. You give God what you have and give Him your best and you watch what God does. So, number one, we start with Scripture. Scripture. And uh, this is really important because it isn't just self-help. It isn't, you know, just meditation. It isn't just, you know, mental processing. We need something outside of us. We need something that, that, that brings clarity, that has strength, that has power. We need help. And we know that God's Word helps us. God's Word is not some old ancient document, you know, as we, as we discussed back in week two, that was written by people who want to be in power. And again, we're, we'll talk about that later on in our apologetic series. No, God's Word is a real Word. It's a living Word, and God's Word speaks to us. And in 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, verse 16, the Apostle Paul, who's writing to this young leader called Timothy. Timothy was a pastor of a local church in modern-day Turkey called Ephesus. And at the time, obviously, he, he was you know, just cutting his teeth and learning how to lead people. And the older Apostle Paul, probably actually writing it from prison, uh, wrote this letter uh, to this young leader and encouraged him about the power of Scripture. He said, all Scripture is God-breathed, meaning it's inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training 
in righteousness, meaning it has many applications. We can be taught or we can teach others. Rebuking means like to, to kind of um, call someone to account, uh, correcting, very similar, training in righteousness. And again, it, it, it's this idea that if we want to grow to become the men and women that God wants us to become, if we want to grow it, it, as Christ followers or just grow uh, to be more like Christ in general, the way we do that is true Scripture. And the end result, verse 17, is a servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Have you ever experienced the frustration of being asked to do a job and not having the tools or the training you need to accomplish that job? I think one of, one of the most frustrating things in the world must be when we're asked and we agree to help someone or do something and we, we aren't supported the way that we need with tools and with equipment. Well, the Word of God thoroughly equips us for every good work. And it isn't just good work in terms of doing uh, good work for God. It's just life in general. We need equipping for life because, I don't know if you notice this, but life is difficult. Life is complicated. As we keep saying in the church, we want to help. And one of the primary ways that we can help you in the complexity of life is by encouraging you to have a system, a methodology, a focus, a moment, an anchor every single day not only where you can get God's Word, not only where you get into God's Word, but where God's Word gets into you. Why? Because the Word equips us to live more like Him and to live more for Him. Like we said right through the series, you know, our lives are instantly better when we're more like Jesus. And again, if you're not a Christ follower and you're thinking, well, I don't want to be more like Jesus, well, let's just pause a second and ask the question, why would you not want to be more like Jesus? Like, if you're an employer, why would you not want employees who are more Christ-like? If you're an employee, why would you not want an employer who's more Christ-like? If you're hoping to be married, why would you not want to be engaged to someone who is more Christ-like? If you're a son or a daughter, why would you not want parents who are more Christ-like? If you're, you know, wherever you are in life, why would we not want? Because let, let's remind ourselves, what is, we say being Christ-like and the word equips us to live for him and live like him. But what does that look like? Well, Christ, we're told, is the definition of, not that he's loving alone, but he is love. And he is peace, and he is patient, and he is gentle, and he is kind, and he came as a servant, and he is generous. This is only a list of few. This isn't exhaustive. It's just listing a few of the highlights of the nature of Christ. Why would we not want to be more like this? Come on, let's be honest. Would our marriages be better or worse off if we were more Christ-like, if we were more loving, peace-orientated, patient, gentle, kind, servant heart than generous? I mean, would, would our businesses and our enterprises and our general human experience throughout life be better if we were more Christ-like? See, I, I understand why our apprehension to become religious and get caught up into all the rules and regulations, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the idea that when we get in the Word and God's Word gets in us, it equips us to be more like Jesus, to be more like Jesus this. And I'm convinced that our world across the board will be better off if more people were like Christ. I know in my heart, I want to be more. As a father, as a husband, as a brother, as, as, a, as, a, as a boss, as a team player, I want to be more like Christ. So the Word of God is useful. <clears throat> it has use. It isn't some ancient, outdated, archaic, old document, it has very real world application for the complexities of our life today. And therefore, not only is the word useful, but by definition, the word is helpful. And like we've said, we need help every single day. And some of us in this room, come on, we have had moments, maybe even recently, I know I've gone through some really tough things recently, where it feels like, man, why is God silent? Where is God? Why isn't God? And, and the challenge, even for some of you right now who are not Christ followers, is maybe one of the reasons why you push back against the Christian message is because you say, well, if God was, if God is, then God would. But the truth is, us shaking our hands towards heaven and saying, God, why are you so silent? When we're not seeking him in his word, it's like this quote that says, complaining about a silent God when your Bible is closed is like complaining about not getting text messages when your phone is turned off. My friends, God is speaking to us every single day. He speaks into our conscience by the Holy Spirit, but primarily he speaks to us through his word. The question is, is, is it on? Is it open? Are we engaged with scripture? Now, when it comes to soap, what we recommend then is that every single one of us has a plan or, or a methodology to read the word every, and I'm not talking about 
quantities. There's all sorts of options. You could read multiple chapters. You could read a book a day. You could read a verse a day. Uh, it again, the quantity isn't what we're talking about. It's the quality. One of the best technologies that we recommend is an app by a group called YouVersion. It's called the Bible app by YouVersion. Uh, it's very well known. Uh, I've actually met the uh, developers who created this app out of a great church in America called Life Church. Uh, in Oklahoma. It's a great, great piece of kit. And if you haven't already, I want to encourage you right now, right now, everyone, come on, everyone, right now, let's pull out our phones, Apple and Android, all technologies are welcome. And I'm going to put two QR codes, okay? The first one uh, is for, uh, first one, sorry, is for Android. The second one's for Apple. So if you haven't already downloaded the Bible app by you version, right now, come on, just open your camera, point it towards the relevant QR code for yourself, and I want you to download this app right now. And as you get into the app, it's really cool because right there in your handheld device, uh, are, it's not just the Word of God, but all different translations. You know, there's contemporary English versions, which are really, really simple English. There's more classic versions like the King James or New King James. There's kind of middle-of-the-road ones like the New American Standard, or NIV. I mean, everything you need is in there. But not only that, but you can click on at the bottom of the app as you download it, the option for plans. And when you get to the plan section, whatever you're going through, whether it be stress with studying, whether it be marriage, whether it be mental health, Maybe you're going through a divorce. Whatever it is, there's a plan for everything that we are going through. There's three-day plans, five-day plans, seven-day plans, 20-day plans. There's one-year plans. There's two-year plans. I mean, there's all sorts of plans. And re in recent days, I've done plans like how to be a better husband. That was like a, a, a seven- or ten-day plan. Uh, I've done recently uh, reading through the Bible one year with Nikki Gumbel, who is the founder of of the Alpha Course. I mean, I just love the fact that I can, if I'm not in a plan, I can find something that's relevant to where I am, and every day it generates for me scripture. And the power isn't in the plan. The power is how the plan brings the relevant scripture that we need into the situation that we find ourselves. And just by taking the moment, by prioritizing a moment every day where we put ourselves in God's Word, <clears throat> and God's Word is in us, we're starting uh, to form a methodology where now we have help from heaven. So the first one is scripture. The second part of soap is observation. Okay, observation. So now that we have our scripture, so just imagine on your phone or in your notebook, you, you've got a blank page, you write the day on the top, is that, that is how I like to do it, and then you write scripture. And what I like to do is I actually like to write, I pick one verse, and I like to write the verse out word for word. It just helps me to memorize it. But not, not just writing the reference, like John 10, 10, but actually writing, I have come that they may have life and life in all abundance. Like just write, I write, write out the verse. The next thing then now is I write O, and this is the observation part, because, because we, want, we want to interact. You don't just read without thinking, you know, turn it into some kind of uh, religious liturgy. We want, to, we want to interact. We want to think. By definition, observation in the English dictionary is the act or instance of viewing or noting a fact or occurrence for some scientific or other special purpose. So again, you don't have to have a PhD in physics to be someone who develops uh, the power of observation because we have a special purpose that's actually more important than science. I mean, being in relationship with God is more important than anything in this world. The special purpose of cultivating a daily devotion with God is a pretty significant motive for us to to view or note facts. So as we're reading the scripture, as we're reading the verse, all we're doing is, is we're thinking. We're thinking and asking ourselves the question, what's happening here? What do I see? And we're noting and observing it. You see, it's not enough simply to read the verse. It's not enough just to memorize the verse. It's not enough just to you know, quote the verse. We need to think about the verse. God gave us the gift of intellect. He gave us a mind. And even though our hearts can feel the presence of God and the power of what we're reading, our minds must also be engaged. And so as we're reading the verse, we're thinking, we're asking questions. As I sometimes train people in our team, I say, hey, approach it like an investigative journalist. Ask the who, what, when, how, why questions. And if you don't, if you get stuck or bogged down, there's all sorts of resources. Another day I can recommend to you things like Bible dictionaries, things like commentaries, things, things like lexicons, and so on and so forth that will help you to get, you know, get clarity in what's happening. But usually, with most of it, it's, it's, it's very simple. What, if you're reading it in context, in the context of the story, you can pretty much figure out what's going on. 
all you're doing is summarizing what's going on in a general sense in the observation section. Why? Because we don't want to just become more knowledgeable. We want to become wise. And again, this has been our word for the whole year, wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. We want to grow in wisdom. It was Marilyn Voss Savant who actually is the woman with the highest IQ in the world, by the way, Guinness Book of Record uh, IQ holder, who said, to acquire knowledge, one must study. But to acquire wisdom, one must observe. So you taking time to think about what's happening and then articulate or capturing that in one sentence or one paragraph is really powerful. Observation asks the question, what does this mean? Observation calls to think. It calls us to meditate. It calls us to, to spend time, whether it's three minutes or three hours, in the text asking the question, what does this mean? mean. There's a famous example of this in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8. So you've got Moses leading the people of Israel uh, out of the desert into the promised land. God says to Moses, your time is done. I'm going to raise up a new leader. His name will be Joshua. Joshua will be the person that God uses to actually lead the Israelite people successfully from the desert into the promised land. And as, uh, you know, this, tra- this leadership, this epic leadership transition is happening, because, you know, whenever you, we watch movies where it's Captain America handing over a shield or, you know, some famous president or whatever, that moment of where one person, leader, hands over and pass on advice is a very significant moment. Well, here is the advice that was given to Joshua at the very start of his leadership career in the first chapter of his book. It says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Now again, this is very interesting because to have you know God's law, God's ordinances, God's truth, however you're going to call it, God's word on our lips, it must be in our heart. It was Jesus said in the New Testament that from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when we're in the Word and the Word is in us, the Word will come out of us. It'll be evident on our lips. But not only that, it says how we do this is we meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. It isn't just a general prosperity or success. It, it's prosperity and success, specifically in terms of what the God had called Joshua to achieve in his mission. Just like for all of us, go, you have a plan. Like whether you're a believer or a Christ follower or not, God has a plan. God created you for a purpose. And we believe the greatest fulfillment in life is knowing God's extraordinary purpose for us and in Christ living it out. It doesn't matter what happens to us uh, in life in terms of, you know, uh, circumstances and things working out when what's happening in us is happening according to what God designed and desired. And to be prosperous or successful in terms of what God's called us to do. And again, it does overflow into, you know, our dreams and desires and life. Not always, though. Uh, the key to this is that we meditate, that we're thinking, that we're observing, that we're, we're contemplating, that we're in the Word, and the Word, of course, is in us. We have a scripture verse. That's the first category. We have an observation. And the third one, then, is application. Application. And in many ways, this is, this is almost the most important part because knowing and thinking without doing equals nothing. Knowing and thinking without doing equals nothing. The power of this whole process is in the application where observation asks the question, what does this mean in general, in context, whatever, in the, in, you know, in terms of the view of history, application goes further and asks the question, what does this mean to me? So me explaining to you what it meant for Joshua, you know, all those years ago as, as the leader of the Israelite people is one thing, but me asking the question, but what does it mean to me today? What, 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 what specific application, if Joshua was my verse, could it have for me today? And application isn't just another form of observation. Application isn't repackaging the observation. Application is very specific. It's, it's, it's saying in light of what's happening, in light of what God has said, in light of this truth, in light of this verse, what is God asking me to do? What, is God, what, is, what does love require of me as a result of what I've just read and what I've just meditated on. It's interesting because in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the author says, the Word of God isn't some, like I keep saying, some old document. It is alive. 
And it is active. And even if you don't believe it right now because you're not a Christ follower, not a person of faith, just think about the fact that the number one selling book in the world is still the Bible. Number one downloaded book is still the Bible. The Bible has been and will be forever because it is not just some historical document to be appreciated and celebrated and for some worshipped. It is a living an active word. It is dynamic. It is, it is transcendent. It is eternal. And it isn't just a, a, a list of rules and regulations. It is, it is the power of God to help encourage, strengthen, and guide our lives. And this word, we're told, is not only alive and active, but it is sharper than any double-edged sword. Why? Because, and here's a great metaphor, it penetrates uh, even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Again, back in these days, when, you know, when this book was written, the uh, book of Hebrews, one of the most prominent weapons was a sword. Maybe today, another analogy would be like a laser. Like the, the word is laser focused. Like it isn't just some general thing that's swung around. It's precise and it's double edged. It has two purposes. It, it kind of it kind of it kind of reveals the content of what's going on in our thoughts and in our heart. It, it shows us. The Bible, in many ways, is like a mirror. God's Word is like a mirror. It shows us not only who God is and what God says, but it shows us, as a result, who we are and where we are in terms of where God wants us to be. It is laser-focused. Again, if you know what I'm talking about, that moment where you're like, God, God help me, and maybe you've, you're soaping, and you read, and it's almost like, my goodness, like, I know that this original text was written for original people, original day, but it's almost like God wrote this for me. Have you ever experienced that where it's like, man, this is for me. Like, this is so specific to what I'm going through. God's Word is accurate. God's Word is living. God's Word is sharp. But God's Word calls. In many ways, it demands an application. Not just what, what's it saying, what does this mean, but what does it mean to me? And more specifically, not just in the general rules and regulations, because this is where the wheels can come off sometimes, where we get trapped in dogma and, and, and religious practice. No, again, let's go back to the beginning of the series. We have a Father in heaven. Jesus, His Son, was sent for us. And when He ascended into heaven, He said, I will send you another advocate, one just like me. And that this Holy Spirit leads us to the heart of the Father. So the question we're asking is not just what does it mean to me in terms of like, bold boy, bold girl, do more, do more. No, no, it's what is the Father saying to me? What is the Father? The point of application is to ask the question, what is the Father? What does the Father want me to know? And you know, our minds always jump to condemnation, right? And judgmentalism. The Father wants me to know, blah, blah, blah. But you know, sometimes the Father just wants you to know that you're loved and you're valued, and you're affirmed, and He sees you, and He's got you, and there's hope for the future. Sometimes what the Father is saying is actually, it's like water in a desert. It's encouragement. It's strengthening. It's helpful, and it's hopeful. But when when our phone is off, when we're not receiving, the Father is sending the messages. I love you. I'm thinking of you. I'm with you. I'll meet you. Whatever. The Father is sending the message, but our, our Bible is closed. Our app is off. Our phone is off. And we're not receiving. God's Word isn't just a, 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 a religious book that challenges our, our, our ethics, our morality, or our spirituality. God's Word is the Word, the voice of the Father. And we see so many examples of this where, one of the classic examples when Jesus has been baptized and God speaks. And what does God say? This is my Son whom I love, and with whom I am well pleased. Sometimes, especially those guys, come on, men, who didn't have that loving, affirming, father-like figure in our world. I know last week just talked about Father's Day. Sometimes we just need a daily affirmation from our Father in heaven. Because here's the challenge. If we don't find it in God, we'll find it somewhere else. And usually finding it somewhere else leads on a path that we never wanted to go down. Hey, let's find our sense of identity. Let's find our self-worth. Let's find our sense of purpose and belonging in our Father in heaven. But it isn't just what is the Father said to be generally, because again, if you're here, you're not a Christ follower. The Father is saying to you specifically, generally, specifically, He loves you. And He wants you to come back to Him. And He wants to be in relationship with you. And if you'd open your heart and give Him a chance, He would reveal the truth of these things to you. 
But it's also a very specific, what is God saying to me today? Because every single day, the Father has a word for us. It's a word for today. And I remember when I became a Christ follower years ago, there was no Bible apps. I actually was just talking with my uh, team the other day about how when I became a Christ follower, if I wanted to find something in the Bible, the very first Christian book I ever bought was a book called a Concordance. And a, a concordance was like a book where let's say you picked the word like wheat and you'd find W in the book in the concordance and it would give you all the references, all the places in the Bible where the word wheat was used. That's how you found stuff back in the... There was no Google. There was no Bible Gateway, no Blue Letter Bible, no BibleHub.org. There was no version Bible. It was like just, you got to find it. And many times you would spend ages flicking through trying to find a, a specific uh, thing. Uh, but not so anymore. Uh, you know, it's all changed with technology. But one of the things we used to have back in the day was a little magazine that was called The Word for Today. It was printed by uh, UCB. And every single day there'd be a little paragraph like inspirational hope and there'd be some scriptures to read. And it was a paper thing. And if you forgot that thing or left down or lost it, it was gone. There was no way to, to upload it to the cloud because clouds back in those days were physical things, not, not technological things. So today we have the ability to connect wherever we are to technology. But God is saying something to us today. Just like this morning when I got up and I was up early and I was praying over his message and praying for all of you. And one by one, my sons woke up in a very predictable order. Everyone else now here, kids all have a predictable order of waking up. And one by one, they all come in. And, and the tendency, especially with boys, is the first thought in their mind after the bathroom is breakfast. Bathroom, breakfast. And of course, the order to get, that never changes. It's just bathroom breakfast. Um, so, you know, I'm on the couch doing my thing, and they walk in, they're heading straight for the cereal breakfast. I'm like, whoa, 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 come here, come here. And of course, they walk over, and the hair is all funny, and they're half asleep, and they're still not even sure if they're dreaming. And it's like, good morning. Or my family, because my wife's from Brazil, we say, bon dia, good morning. And I give them a little kiss, and I affirm them, because every day I want my kids to start with affirmation from the fire, gentle touch that says, I see you, and I love you. Every day, whether you have that or had that, from your physical father, your heavenly father wants to affirm us every day. What is God, what is the father saying to me today? It was C.S. Lewis who said this, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. We can't go back and undo what is done. We can't rewrite the past. What we can do is make a decision today to change the ending. And by prioritizing daily God's scripture, by spending time meditating, contemplating, being in it as it's in us, and then asking the question, what is the Father saying to me today? We're not just starting a new routine. We're not just starting a new practice. We're actually changing how our story ends. Because when our life is guided and led by, what is the Father saying to me? Well, like we said, the Father is love. He is peace. He is kindness. He is uh, generous, he is served, he has all these qualities, then what that does for us is it makes not only us better at life, but it makes our lives better, more richer. Because no matter what we go through, we're becoming more Christ-like. And that has a profound effect, not only in our lives, but also in our legacy. We can't change the start, but we can change the ending. So scripture, observation, application. What's the final, fourth and final piece? It's, of course, prayer. We end with prayer. Like we said in week two, prayer can be defined as a personal communication, our petition, which is like a request, addressed to a deity, God, especially in the form of supplication, also like a request or an ask, adoration, praise, contrition, which is like an act of humbling ourselves, uh, or thanksgiving. Okay, and like we said, prayer, back in week two, is a, is a per, the first part of this statement we want to focus on. It's personal communication. Prayer isn't monologue. Prayer isn't a religious liturgy, prayer is a conversation. And prayer has many different facets. But in the context of soaping, prayer is a conversation. And don't get me wrong, we don't wait to pray at the end. As we're reading Scripture, we're praying. As we're observing, we're praying. As we're applying, we're praying. Because we're talking to God. We're, we're reading and, God, what do you want to say to me? We're observing God. What's going on here? God, what are you saying to me specifically? And then at the end, of course, you actually pray, pray. You know, you actually say, okay, here, here's, what I'm, here's what I need. Here's what I'm hopeful for. Here's what I'm worried about. Here's, here's my anxiety. We pray, pray. But the point is this. Prayer isn't just, in a soaping sense, a personal communication. Prayer is also a guidance system. 
I know we have it all on our phone now, but again, back in the day, if you wanted to have a, gu- a digital guiding system, you had to buy it a separate, I know this will blow your mind, there was a separate piece of kit called a GPS, and it used to cost hundreds and hundreds of euros, probably still do, and you'd mount your dashboard, and if you're lucky enough to get satellite signal, it would tell, and it was like revolutionary. Now, of course, there's many classic examples, people are kind of crash the rivers and stuff because the satellite go offline, uh, but it's so amazing me how far we've come that now all this kit is in our phone. It's amazing. But just like traveling with Google Maps or Apple Maps or GPS system, uh, we help to get where we want to go. In the same way, prayer is like a global positioning system. It's not that God has lost us. It's, it's, not, it's not that God doesn't know where we are. God knows exactly where we are. The reason why we need GPS, the GPS knows where you are. That's how it finds you. The, the reason why GPS exists isn't because it doesn't know where you are. It's because you don't know where you are. And more importantly, you don't know how to get out of where you are to where you want to go. In the same way, prayer isn't just a personal conversation. Prayer helps us to establish where we are. Prayer helps us to establish, ascertain where we want to go. And prayer helps us to get there. Prayer is like our very own spiritual, global positioning system. Some of you have family tracking software in your kids' phones where you can open an app like Life360 and you can see all your kids. Uh, that's good for you as a parent, but prayer is not God's way of keeping track of us. Prayer is our way of keeping track of us in relation to where God is. So prayer isn't just a conversation. Prayer is also a guidance tool. But prayer, more than that as well, is also, um, how would you describe it? Prayer is 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 a system or a, or a vehicle or a method to which we get real, to which we confess. Because sometimes, let's be honest, come on, you can with me now for a second. Lean in here. Sometimes we can just go through stuff and we just say things that we know we can't really say to anybody else because maybe our circle of trust is small, maybe because they're not ready, we're not ready. Sometimes we just say things. And the great thing about prayer, when we think about <clears throat> scripture, observation, application of prayer, is prayer asks the question, what do I need <clears throat> to say to the Father? So we know that true application, the Father speaks to us. But in our prayer, we're saying, what do I need to say to the Father? Not just in general, but what do I need to say to the Father today? Because every day, there's a need to speak to the Father. And it's in confession, in acknowledgement, in being real with God, that we get clarity as to where we are. And thank God for His grace and mercy. He is love, He is patient, He is kind, He is generous, He is great, He is all things. Because God doesn't condemn us or shame us or judge us. God shows us the way forward. He shows us the way back to Him. He shows us the way out of our junk. In Psalm 119 and verse 105, it says that the Word of God is like a lamp for our feet, a light on our path. Notice that the author doesn't say it's like a floodlight. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't show us the whole road. It's a lamp. What does is, what is a lamp or a torch do? It gives us enough light to take the next step and the next step. And as we keep trusting and applying and observing and praying and talking, conversing and keep taking steps, all of a sudden we look back and realize, hang on a second, I have not just moved, I have progressed I have progressed in my dreams, my desires, my relationship with God. I have progressed in my calling, my purpose, in my marriage, in my fatherhood, in my mothering. Whatever it is, I have progressed in God's call for my life. It was Corey Ten Boom who said, Is prayer the steering wheel or the spare tire of your life? For many people, unfortunately, it's a spare tire. It's, it's, to, it's, it's only used break glass in case of emergency, like a fire extinguisher. Like, oh no, I'm in trouble. I've made a mistake. And so I'm going to crack this thing open and hope for the best. And you know what? If you're here and you're not a Christ follower, or maybe you were a Christ follower, or not anymore, or not currently following Christ, you know what? Thank God that that option will always be there. God will always be a breath away from wherever you are. You're never too far away or too far gone for a faith, an honest, authentic prayer and faith to reach the Father in heaven. And that's the way you want to live your life, constantly putting up fires, constantly on the edge. That's fair enough. But for those of us who want more and perhaps want to grow in wisdom, the idea that prayer could be a steering wheel that guides and directs our life, that helps us to foresee, oh, that's a bad decision, avoid that, 
or that's a distraction, avoid that, or that's going to lead into a car crash, avoid that. Just something that helps us every single day to take daily steps towards health, towards God's purpose, God's plan, towards Christ like this. And so as we close the series, as we close the message, what I want to let you know is that you, like me, we help every single day. And as I hand back over to Rebecca in Dublin and Sam and Navin, and they close off this series, I want to encourage you, why not consider soaping? You know, I'm not just someone who preaches. I practice. I, I soap as much as I can. I really believe in the power of this. This is my soap journal. It's got a cool quote from Nelson Mandela. It says, it always seems possible. It always seems impossible until it's done. That's just a really kind of really cool reminder to me every single day that nothing's impossible for God. I want to encourage you, whether you're a Christ or not, think about this. Would your life be richer? Would your life be better if you were conversing talking, hearing, thinking, meditating, applying God's voice, God's word in your life or not. Because if we don't find help in this, then where? We all need help every day. Back over to Sam and Rebecca. Hey, we are so grateful that you could join us today. We really hope and pray that you were encouraged, that you feel blessed by this message. And you know, it would really help us if you could click the like button and also subscribe to our channel because we want to get this message across Ireland and the world and that would really, really help us. So please go and do that. Um, and also to let you know that you can watch and listen to previous messages and find out a whole bunch of stuff on our website, Lighthouse Church. And something else that's really cool, Jake. Tell us about something our else. Today. Yes, guys, <laughs> we have a brand spanking new Lighthouse Church app. Yeah. So make sure to go download it on our website, or you can download it via the app stores. And there's a lot of cool things in there. You can rewatch previous messages, and there's also some downloadable content for you guys. So make sure to download the Lighthouse Church app. And there's also the Old Fashioned Bible on it. Bible is so important. So, and you know what? Even better than this experience today that we've had is church in person. It's just so good. We meet every Sunday morning in Navin and in Dublin. You can find out all the information on our website, uh, but it's at 11 a.m. every Sunday in person, and we have the best time. So come join us. Uh, we would love to have you with us. So we'll see you next week for Lighthouse Church Online, 7 p.m. Yes. right here. And also, don't forget to follow our social media handles, lighthousechurch.ie. So we'll see you next week, guys. Bye.